All right, section 1.2, we're going to encounter um, maybe the one that not be first, because we talked about tangent lines last time. Um, but one of the really big concepts inside of calculus, and that's the concept of the word limit. What, does, what do we mean by limit? Um, first of all, in this particular section, we're going to approach it from a very intuitive way. So we're going to think about it kind of in, in terms of what do we visually mean? How do we think about it? Not in a very rigorous, written down mathematical way. Okay? So that's kind of to give you a little heads up first. To start with, the limit concept that we're going to use right now is that a limit is a y value that you approach that you may or may not actually touch. Okay. So if the graph is nice, smooth, continuous, there are y values that we touch. If we have things like asymptotes or holes in graphs, um, sharp turns, things like that, limits may not be values that we do touch. They may just be values we get really close to. A little bit of notation. Um, you're going to see notation that looks like this throughout this section. And each of those notations are very, very similar. They're all notations for finding limits. And they're all you know, y values that you're getting close to and may or may not touch. But they describe how you get close to the x value in different ways. So if there's a little plus sign right here, it means you approach the value from the right. And if you think about that, that kind of makes sense. The right-hand side of the graph is the positive side of the graph, right? That's what that's telling you. The plus means from the right-hand side, the positive side of the graph. If there's a negative, it means that it's approaching from the left-hand side of the graph or the negative side of the graph. And if there isn't anything after that, it means you have to approach the value from both directions. So if you imagine that this is your graph, and you care about finding the limit at, say, this particular value right here, from the right means you're tracing along this curve going this way. Okay, so you're moving along the curve from the right-hand side towards your point. So you're moving left, I get that, but you're doing it from the right-hand side, okay? So this would be the limit as you're approaching this, I'll call, I'll call this A, this A value from the right, okay? Um, if you're doing this from the left, it sort of looks like you're coming, you know, from the bottom of the graph, basically, but it is the left values. We're all talking about x values. So these are x values that are smaller than the one we're looking at. So this would be the limit as you're approaching that x value of a from the left, because you're moving from the left-hand side of the graph. And again, if there is no value, it means that you have to be able to come from both directions. All right? Both ways we have to be able to do this. So we're going to be using that notation as we see um, different problems in this section. If a limit exists, it will do so if and only if the corresponding one-sided limits exist. So if we have one of the li limits that goes up to infinity and the other one actually approaches a value, limit doesn't exist because one side, it didn't actually work. So in order for a limit, as in the limit as x approaches just a plain value a without the plus or the minus afterwards, in order for that to exist, for that particular function value, the limit from the left has to be equal and it has to exist, and the limit from the right has to be equal and has to exist. And I think the next slide actually, no, it doesn't. This is where I was going to write it in, yeah. So these have to exist. If they don't exist, I can't put equal something anyway. That doesn't make any sense. Um, they have to exist and they have to be the same. Okay, so we're going to encounter a graph next so I can show you what this actually looks like in terms of a practical picture. Does everyone have this one written down? Excellent. All right, so here's our picture. I think it's the picture that matches the one in your paper, at least fairly close. Um, we're going to interpret that each one of these hash marks, even though it's not marked, which is not good, but there's only so much that Microsoft Word will really cooperate with sometimes with graphs. Um, it's not really meant for that. But these are the values 1, 2, 3, and this is negative 1 and negative 2 and negative 3, and this is 1, 2, 3. You know, it, it, it's not intended to sort of be distracting or, or wrong. Um, it's just a kind of a, a glitchy kind of thing inside of Word. Okay. 
So th these are the values. They're what you expect. All right, so we're going to take these one at a time. You'll notice that there is a sort of a break in the graph, right? If you were tracing this graph, you would have to pick up your pencil in the middle of it to continue drawing it, right? We call that discontinuous, right, when something has that sort of a, a break in the graph. Um, and notice that the break's happening at exactly the value that the questions are happening around, isn't it? At least the first three. Um, and that, that's on purpose, because I want to show you that it matters whether you're doing the right, the left, or both sides. Okay? All right, so the first one says that we are going to approach the limit from which direction? What does this mean right here? The right. The right. So the right-hand side of the graph would be over here. Yeah? Now, we have to be on the curve not the axes. The axes is just giving us sort of a position, right? If we're not really like where that actually is happening, like our graph's not there, then we're not on the graph. The graph itself is the curve that we're on. So we're up here where I've sort of drawn that pink arrow pointing left. And it doesn't really matter where we start, we just need to start to the left-hand side of the value negative one. So if you start where I just marked, that's great. If you happen to start here, that's fine too. You're still left or you're still to the right-hand side of the value negative one. So either way, as you move, you're moving along the same path. And you're moving along the path until you get to what looks on my screen like a, a, a white dot. On your paper, it looks like an open circle, right? Circle not filled in. And the question you ask yourself is, when I get to the end of this place where x is equal to negative 1, what y value am I very, very close to? And your answer would be 2. And that's your answer all there is to it. The y value that I get very close to as I approach from the right hand side is the y value of 2. Now we're going to do it again, but we're going to do it from the left hand side. So the left hand side is over here. We're going to use green, which you can't hardly see. Maybe I'll try something different. How about blue. All right, so we're going to try it from the left-hand side, like this. So negative means from the left, so we're moving along the graph, approaching the value x equals negative 1, but from the left-hand side now. And what y value are we getting close to? And in this case, yeah, we're actually on it the whole time, right? It's the value of 1. The y value is the value 1. Now, the previous slide said if the limit, that is the two-sided limit, exists, it can only happen if the two one-sided limits actually are the same. Right? They have to meet. Is that happening on our graph? No. One side of it comes in at 2, and the other side of it comes in at 1, and they are not meeting each other. They are apart. And it doesn't even matter how far apart they are. If they're apart at all, they are not exactly the same number, then the limit does not exist. So you can actually write out the whole phrase does not exist if you'd like. If you'd like to abbreviate it as well, it's DNE. This, this limit at x equals negative 1 or as x approaches negative 1 does not exist. Okay, now notice on part D let me clear out my dots. My, my arrows that I've got drawn everywhere in here. Notice on part D, it asks about the limit as a one-sided or a two-sided limit. It is a two-sided limit. It, it doesn't sort of give us the A and the B that we just had for part C before that, right? It's just wanting us to do it anyway, though. We still have to do it. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to mark that location on my graph. Well, that location is, is right here, right? And that, that's the location that I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to do it from the left-hand side first. So from the left-hand side, what value am I getting close to? Yeah, it's, it's 1, just like I, I did when I did my left-hand limit before. It's 1. Now, on the right-hand side, it feels a little bit awkward. And this is where the statement that I made before is, is it doesn't matter where we start. If you decide that you're going to start your graph or start tracing your graph over here, that's cool. If you decide you're going to start tracing your graph here, that's cool. Both of those are to the right-hand side of the value x equals negative 2, right? Now, if you start further over here, it's fine. It just means you're going to keep tracing. And at some point here, you're going to jump down. 
right? You're gonna, it's like jumping down a set of stairs. You're gonna jump two steps down and you're gonna keep going, okay? Eventually, no matter where you start, you still end up at the x equals negative two location, don't you? You do. And what y value are you approaching as you approach that particular x value? One. It's still one. So on this one, from the left-hand side, we approach negative one, or approach one. From the right-hand side, again, we may have had a jump down, but we still also approach one. So what is this limit going to be? One, because it worked from both sides, right? Eventually, they both arrived at the same location, the same y value, when we got to that x value spot. So this value actually will end up existing, and it's the value of one. All right, um, I throw this last one in here, not to be sort of awkward about it, but because your book occasionally will do this where it isn't precise, and I, I don't want it to sort of concern you, but this last one tells you that x approaches zero. So where is x equal to zero? What, what is that otherwise known as? The y-axis, right? And, and, and often it's a y-intercept in particular on a graph. Um, so on this one, it, it is this particular point right here that we're talking about, yeah? So if we go from the left-hand side, that's where we're sort of going to have the jump on this one, right? So if I, if I do this from the left, I'm going to have this going on. I have to jump up the set of stairs. Um, okay, and then if I approach from the right-hand side, I'm going to be doing it from over here. They approach the same pink dot, agreed? It's the same pink dot. It's not clearly marked, so we're just going to give our best estimate of what it appears to be. What value does that appear to be at? Y value, remember? 2.8, 2.75, 2.6, somewhere in there, right? I mean, there's, you certainly cannot tell me it's 1.2. Um, but there's some fluctuation in what you might answer that would be acceptable. So something like, I think you guys, what I heard was 2.8 first, so I'm going to write down 2.8 for us this time. So some, somewhere around that. If it bothers you to put equals, since you are sort of looking at it visually and saying, I think, you could put an approximation, and that would be appropriate there. Either way would be fine. Any questions on this picture and how you process through this? Okay. Uh, we are going to get back on the calculator briefly. Excellent. Okay. Numerical limits. So last time what we did in class and what we did at the very beginning of this class is we looked at finding, uh, estimating the slope numerically and estimating distance numerically, right? Well, what we're going to do in this section is we're going to estimate limits numerically. So let's take a look at what this actually means in terms of x values and so forth, and then we'll get back on the calculator and see how it works when we're actually using this. All right, so it says use numerical and graphical evidence, so we are going to look at a graph here in a minute, to conjecture. Do you know what the word conjecture means? Guess. It's a fancy word for guess. It means to make an educated guess. A conjecture is just an educated guess. So to guess whether the limit exists, and if it does exist, what you think it looks like it's going to be. Okay? So basically, we're going to take what the calculator can do for us in a graph, what the calculator can do for us in numbers, and we're going to use it to make an educated guess. All right, so if this one says that we want to find out if the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 9 over x minus 3 exists. If it does exist, we're going to figure out what it looks like it is, and if it doesn't exist, we're going to put down D and E. Now, what we need to do is, just like with our graph, we need to come from the left-hand side and from the right-hand side to see what happens, correct? Now, we really don't care about the values on the ends of the graph. I don't care what happens when x is 10 or when x is 100. That has nothing to do with what happens when x is 3. I really only care about the values that get really close to 3. So those are the only values I'm going to put into my table. Now, I'm going to do the ones from the left-hand side first, and this is going to feel a little bit like something we did last time. 2.9, awfully close to 3, yeah? It's close, smaller, but close. But I'd like to get a little closer. What would I do? 2.99. And what might I do next? Yeah, 2.999. I mean, we could keep doing this indefinitely, but we need about three of them to establish that we've got a real picture of what's going on with our numbers. But this is from the, the left-hand side. It's value smaller than 3. I also need to do this from the right-hand side, values bigger than 3. So what might those look like? 
3.01 and 3.001. It's almost like we've seen something like this before, isn't it? We have. All right, so we're going to take our calculator and we're going to put that function inside of y1. And we're going to go into our table and we're going to put these x values in our table. All right, so remember when you're using your calc the calculator, if you've got a numerator and denominator that have addition or subtraction in them, they, they do need to be in sets of parentheses for the calculator to understand the whole thing you're entering is the numerator. So I'm going to have a parenthesis. I'll do my x squared minus 9 and close my parenthesis. And then I'm going to do division and do the x minus 3 and close my parenthesis as well. If you don't have those parentheses around there, it will think that the only thing that it's, gets divided is the 9 and the x. The 9 at the end, the x at the beginning. And it's not going to give you the kind of answers you're expecting. All right, so we're going to go into the table. I'm going to put in 2.9, 2.99, and 2.999, and then 3.1, 3.01, and 3.001. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to write them down. So this is 5.9. 5.99 and 5.999. On the other side, I've got 6.1, 6.01, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99. And what we're looking for is we're looking to see if as we go down this list of y values, right, the limit is a y value, if there is a y value that we appear to be approaching in each list. So we'll do one list at a time. If we look at the first list, the 5.9, 5.99, and so forth, what does it look like that we're approaching? I'll call it L. It, it looks like, I'll call it even L1 since we've got two L's here going on. It looks like it's getting close to six. What does it look like if we're approaching it um, on L2 over here? It also looks like 6, doesn't it? So from a numerical standpoint, this appears that this limit is 6. That's just numbers. Just looking at the numbers, that's what it looks like. Okay, next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a graph. So we haven't actually done any graphing per se that is to look at a graph on this. Um, let's make sure that everybody's set up for their window to be appropriate. I'm going to hit window. Mine looks a little bit funky right now because I've got negative 10 to 10. That's okay. The y min and the y max are kind of funny. I'm going to change those to negative 10 to 10 just so that they are a standard square kind of window. And I'm going to graph this. What does the graph look like visually? Looks like a straight line. Looks linear, doesn't it? Which might feel a little bit awkward to you if you look at that particular equation. You might know why. You might not. We don't need to discuss it at the moment. We definitely are going to discuss it later. Uh, there's a reason for that, but it does look like a line. Um, what you can do is you can actually trace your graph. So if you hit the trace button and you just trace along the graph until you, you can see down here at the bottom that it tells you the x value that you're on right here and you're looking for that x value to get close to 3. And if you trace along there until the x value is close to 3, you're kind of just wanting to know, are your values nearby 6? And they do appear to be nearby 6, right? So if it says, this one actually says, numerical and graphical evidence. So the numerical evidence is my tables. The graphical evidence is to draw a graph of what I'm seeing. <coughs> so my graph looks something like this, where at three, I appear to be at six, right? That's the graphical evidence that it's referring to. All right, you ready to take a look at the next, the next one? What's different between 2 and 3? There's only one small thing that's different. Yeah, the numerator has a positive sign between my terms, so it's actually a sum of squares on top instead of a difference of squares. That's the only thing that's changed. Uh, the reason I point that out is because that means the process that we're about to do here is going to be very much the same. My tables are going to look like the same x values. My calculator is going to look the same in terms of the values of x that I put in there. So I can sort of repeat the same things that I just did. And in doing so, you might think that that means that the outcome should be something similar. Um, and we're going to see that all that changing that one thing does is that it just changes everything, actually. So we'll take a look at that. So these are my input values. And those are the input values in my table, too, still, because I still have them in there. 
Oh, I didn't change my graph. I'm sorry. Make sure you change your y equals to have a plus there between x squared plus 9. And then into my table, I've got values that look quite different than I had just a moment ago. I've got negative 174.1, negative 1794.01, negative 17,994.001. As you're doing these, you're going to record to six decimal places unless they stop sooner. These have all stopped sooner, so I don't have six decimal places, but I've got 186.1, 1,800.01, 1,800.01, 1,800.01. Point zero zero one. Table's all filled in. Let's use the table before we go looking at the graph. So hold tight to the idea of the graph for a moment. We're going to go down the first column. What seems to be happening to those y values? They're getting smaller, but sometimes we say that a little bit differently too. What's it look like? So they're, they're all negative, which is why they're getting smaller is what you're referring to. But they're getting very, very big negative numbers, right? So they're just like plummeting down, right? I mean, like times 10 is what these numbers are doing. Do you see that? Like we went from 174 to 17,000 to, seven, you know, to, uh, 1700 to 17,000. If I put in another one, I might expect that I would be at 170,000, right? What do you think in terms of what maybe you've done in previous math classes we might say is happening here. Not in terms of a graph, but in terms of the numbers. What value are we approaching? It looks like negative infinity, okay? So this is actually appears to be going towards negative infinity because it's going down infinitely fast, basically. What about the other one? Yeah, same thing, but they're all positive. So this one looks like positive infinity. All right, so are they the same? No, negative infinity and positive infinity are not the same. So what would we say about this limit? It does, not does not exist. You got it. Well done. D and E. Before we graph it, any guesses from a graph standpoint what might be happening here? Do you remember what it's called? A vertical asymptote. That's sort of the expectation that we're going to see. So we're going to take a look at it. I'm just going to hit graph from where I'm at. I don't think it's actually going to be a good window. I'll show you how to fix that in a second. Um, the first half is actually pretty good. Um, this definitely has this sort of feel like it's plummeting down. I get that. But I don't see anything over here. I know it's there because I saw values in my table that showed that it was there. So what I want, I'm going to do, just so I can verify visually that, that it is doing what I'm expecting it to do, I'm just going to change my window. And I'm going to make my Y max a little bit bigger. Um, in fact, I'm going to make it just, I'm going to make it go all the way to 100. And so I'm going to make my Y minimum go to negative 100 just so that it's symmetric. Okay? I'm going to graph and we'll see if that will help me. I'm not sure if it will, but we're going to try. Oh, I think that did it okay, didn't it? Now, your calculator might not actually fill this in with a straight line. In fact, hopefully it doesn't. I have an older version of a TI 83. TI 83s are not quite as uh, clean as the TI 84s. There should not be a straight line there, right? Um, it's my calculator's attempt to connect the dots, and it doesn't do so well, because they really shouldn't connect those two dots. So this vertical line is really not a part of what's going on. However, it is the asymptote that it's actually filling in. Uh, so that's kind of cool here. So yes, so if you look at this going from the left-hand side, it is, in fact, plummeting down to negative infinity. From the right-hand side, it is going up to positive infinity. Um, and so we do, in fact, get an asymptote there, and the limit does not exist because it is not approaching the same value from both sides of the graph. So in terms of our graph, again, it's not really, the point of my graph is not supposed to be a perfectly scaled drawing, but we do want to indicate from the graph that we get what's going on sort of from a picture point of view. That is that this piece is going down, okay, and that this piece is going up. And I don't even care what happens on the end of the graphs at all. I care about what's happening near x equals 3. So that's sort of my focal point when I draw the picture. Okay? Any questions on that one? Okay, I have one more example for us to take a look at. In this example, we are actually given some details and asked to sketch a graph. 
Now, usually when your book does this, it means that your graph and your graph and your graph are not all going to be alike. At least they don't have to be. And they could all be correct. So that's something to keep in mind. So if you looked, for instance, like at the back of the book, it might say something like, one possible answer is, and it'll give you a picture. So don't be disconcerted if your, your version doesn't quite look like theirs. Uh, but it will have some features in common, obviously, the features that it just lists here. So let's go through some of these features, and we'll pl plot, plot in excuse me, the pieces that do, in fact, have to match. And that's where we'll start. So the first thing it tells us is f of 0 equals 1. What does that mean? That's a very detailed piece of information. OK, so when, say that a little bit louder. This is a point on my graph. There will be a point at the ordered pair 0, 1. So if your graph doesn't have 0, 1 plotted on there, that would be a problem. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go down here in our graph, and we're going to plot 0, 1, which would be right here. Right? And in some sort of sense, we've sort of taken care of that piece of information, so I'm just going to mark it out to recognize that we've already done that part. All right, the next two pieces of information tell us stuff about limits. The first one tells us the limit as x approaches 0 from the left. And then the second one is x approaching 0 from the right. And notice they don't match, right? And one of them's at 2 and one of them's at 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark them on the graph in a bit of a different way, just to kind of give you an idea of how that works. Um, they're both x equals 0 values. But they're approaching values on the y-axis that are different. So one of them is approaching 0, uh, I'm sorry, approaching the value of y equal 2. We've got an open circle there, and that's on purpose. The circle is not filled in. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same thing at, x e or at y equals 3, open circles. Uh, do notice, though, that this one right here at uh, 0, 1 is filled in. That is a solid dot. So a couple things here. Why does it matter? Well, if you have a solid dot on all three of them, you do not have a function anymore. So remember something called the vertical line test? It says that if I drop vertical lines, it should only cross the graph in one place. Well, if I dropped a vertical line along the y-axis and I had three dots, I don't have a function. And I know I do because that's the f of x notation. It says function. So I, I can't have three dots. I can't have two dots either. I have to have at most one dot. And I do have that one dot because it told me f of 0 is 2. I mean, f of 0 is 1. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so what does this mean now? Well, it means from the left-hand side over here, I need to be getting close to this particular open dot, right? And then that's where you get the flexibility of all you want to do. You can do anything on the left-hand side as long as as you move from the left to the point x equals 0, you get approaching that particular value. So maybe you're really creative and you do something like this. I don't know. You can be creative. I'm not a particularly creative person, so mine probably wouldn't be near so much fun. But you can be creative. Uh, you can also be extremely uncreative. And you could do something like this. It's the exact opposite of creative, right? Very boring. Straight horizontal line. You could do straight horizontal lines in both ways. You could do linear graphs. You could make them look like polynomials or trig functions. They can look like anything. But they have to hit those open circles. Because what we have to have true is that as we approach from the left along whatever curve we get, we're approaching the y value of 2. And if we approach from the right, we're approaching the y value of 3. So we have to get close to those open circles. So this graph that I drew is an acceptable option, okay? as long as we get close to both of those values in that way. Any question on those? That's telling you what the function actually equals at that location. That's the open, I mean, that's the closed in circle. It's part of the graph, but with this problem and why I put it into the lesson the way I did is that I want you to recognize you could have limits that sort of do this sort of a, a discontinuity thing going on. They don't actually get close to either of the actual function values of the graph. The function value is something else all, all entirely. It doesn't have to actually be a point on the graph at all. And that can happen. Any other questions? All right. 